It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, thanks very much. My first question this morning is to the Premier. Following the Armed Forces report uh, back around the end of May last year, the Premier uh, pledged this, and I quote, As soon as we received this report on Monday, we launched a full investigation, and the results of our investigation will be turned over to the police. Yesterday, it was made clear by the Solicitor General, in fact, in her uh, media scrum, that there was no investigation launched. The investigation he promised never, in fact, took place. Why not? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member opposite for the question. The patient ombudsman, the Auditor General, and the Long-Term Care Commissioners have scrutinized the events of the COVID-19 pandemic in long-term care, and the Ontario Ombudsman is currently examining and investigating as well. All deaths in long-term care homes are required to be reported to the coroner, and where appropriate, he also investigates. The Premier promised an investigation in the wake of the Canadian Armed Forces report, and that investigation took place. Each home was inspected by two or more inspectors, some of those lasting over a month. Those reports were posted publicly. Had inspectors found potentially criminal conduct, they would have passed that information on to the police. Leader of the Opposition, supplementary. Speaker, there's just no evidence that the Premier actually followed through on his promise for an investigation. There was no investigation. There were no police charges. The Commission, in fact, we all know, found that 26 people in long-term care died not of COVID-19, but of dehydra dehydration and neglect. In fact, for the last several days, the Premier and the Minister have refused to tell Ontarians when they learned of this horrifying fact, what they knew and when. So the Premier promised, he promised the people of this Ontario, he promised grieving families that there would be an investigation, that there would be accountability, that there would be justice. Why, at the time of these families' greatest pain, did the Premier decide to lie to them? The opposition will withdraw the unparliamentary remark. I withdraw, Speaker. Why did the Premier make uh, the uh, promise to families that he had no intention of keeping? Minister of Long Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. I, I, once again, I reject the premise of, of this statement that's been included in, in a question. The virus moved faster than any government could have. And in April of last year, we were being updated daily with the situation in long-term care homes across the province. A whole structure had been created to address this issue. What we did know is that several homes were in very dire circumstances. Their staffing was collapsing. They had critical problems in the delivery of care to residents. And we moved quickly to activate uh, the request for the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, these homes had a large number of staff that were either sick, uh, off because of potential co uh, contact with COVID, or afraid. The remaining staff were overwhelmed, and the homes were spiralling down, and, and we knew Response. these homes were in dire situation, and that's why we called in uh, the Canadian Armed Forces. And the, for the Armed Forces did their preparation and were in the homes uh, by April 26. We knew it was needed, and that's why we stepped up along with other, other, all the other measures that we had taken. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, sadly, families have learned that the Premier's words are meaningless. There was no investigation, as he promised. There were no criminal charges laid. The second wave of COVID-19 took more lives than the first wave because there was no plan to protect seniors. Speaker, after breaking the promise about the iron ring along, around long-term care, after breaking the promise of an investigation after the Canadian Armed Forces report was released, why would anybody in Ontario believe a word this Premier says about fixing long-term care? Minister of Long-Term Care. 
Thank you, um, Speaker. Long before the pandemic hit, uh, our government was addressing the long-standing issues uh, that both the Auditor General report have pointed to, as well as the Commission in Long-Term Care. Long-standing structural issues, both with the capacity and the staffing and the crowding in long-term care, that uh, the governments preceding for 30 years n did not address. What we did during the pandemic was absolutely put every resource possible, whether it was the integration um, with the acute care sector, getting the public health units uh, into the homes immediately, monitoring these homes in a structure uh, that was intended to know in, in detail what these homes we're going through, uh, integrating with the acute care sector, uh, using the staffing like the Ontario Resident Support Aids, and also the uh, the pandemic pay, the temporary wage increases, making sure that we were getting the IPAC teams into the homes, uh, uh, including Response. the expertise, and really uh, looking at our commitment to an unprecedented four hours of direct care, billions of dollars to develop the capacity and the staffing, 27,000 staff to be hired. There is a plan, we're acting on it, and we've been doing this all along, even through the pandemic. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. The Commission report that was released last Friday uh, was horrific in its detailing of the situation in long-term care. Uh, neglect, dehydration, COVID-19 running rampant. Yesterday, the Premier said, and I quote, the buck stops with me. But it looks like the only thing that this Premier is taking responsibility for is passing that buck. In fact, back in April uh, of last year, on April 23rd of last year, he said pretty much the same thing. At the end of the day, the buck stops with me. He's not here to get that buck, but it stops with him. The Leader of the Opposition knows full well she can't make reference to the absence of any member. Please don't do it again. And conclude your question. Since that day, when he made that claim last year, 3,136 seniors died from COVID-19 in long-term care. So the question is, question? is it really meaningful at all when the, when the Premier claims that the buck stops with him? Because the Commission said, and I quote, there was no plan to protect residents in long-term care. Does the Premier take responsibility for that? Thank you, Speaker. Uh, again, I've said repeatedly that I take full responsibility for the well-being of residents, staff, their families. I was doing this long before I became Minister of Long-Term Care as a family doctor, serving the vulnerable, serving our community, and, and providing, in some instances, life-saving care. Uh, every government for over 30 years has failed our seniors. The Ray government, Harris, Eves, McGuinty, and Wynne. And it is this government that began as soon as we were elected to understand the need, the overcrowding, the capacity issues in long-term care, and to understand what could be done, creating a standalone ministry, making sure that we had a focus on the needs of, of residents, putting them at the centre, addressing these issues with a, a, a monumental commitment, with dollars behind it Response. for four hours of daily direct care, which no previous government had ever done, which would put us leaders in the country. The 27,000 staff needed to do that. Uh, rebuilding the homes, rebuilding the staff. All Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, as I've already said, the families in this province have learned the hard way that the Premier's words are meaningless. On March 30th of 2020, uh, the Premier said, and I quote, there was an iron ring of protection around long-term care. The Commission report says clearly there was no iron ring. It was a fallacy. The majority of those who died in the first wave of COVID-19 died between March 22nd and April 22nd, when this supposed iron ring was supposed to be in place. In fact, the Commission said this, and I quote, no plan to provide a surge of workers to replace those who inevitably could not or would not come, in, come to work in a pandemic. No plan, again quoting, for infection control. Does the Premier take responsibility for that? Mr. Care. 
Thank you, Speaker. Despite the remarks from the, the member opposite, there was a plan. There was a plan even before the pandemic, uh, as I've mentioned. And during the pandemic, we were taking every measure to shore up the staffing. Ontario resident support aides, the pandemic pay, the temporary wage increase, we were able to hire into long-term care over 8,600 uh, staff members. We were also making sure that we were integrating with the acute care sector to get that expertise into the home, the infection prevention and control expertise, the public health expertise, and we were making emergency orders and amending regulations as quickly as, we, as was possible to address these issues. And then we also maintained during this the imperative of making sure that we could redevelop and modernize this sector with a plan to rebuild the staffing that had been so long neglected and rebuild the capacity, create the integration into the community, create the integration Response. of the public health. And you know, the Premier said, we stand here and point to all the problems we inherited. We can point to 30 years of underinvestment from government, Liberal, Conservative and NDP. None of that matters because we are the government today and we do not want them to look back in 20 years and say what more we could. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, shockingly, shockingly, tragically, in fact, avoidably, the second wave was worse than the first wave. On September 24th, this minister said this, and I quote, we have a comprehensive plan that will address the issues in long-term care to stabilize homes, to stabilize the staffing. There is a robust plan. There are dollars behind it. And then she went on to say, 99.7% of our long-term care homes in Ontario are managing very well. I think she was taking lessons from the Minister of Education when she said that. But Speaker, 1, sorry, 1,902 seniors lost their lives to COVID-19 in long-term care after the minister made those claims. The commission was clear. There was no staffing plan. There was no infection control plan. There was no Question. iron ring. Will the premier of this province take responsibility for that? And if he won't, will he stop saying that he's taking responsibility? Minister Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for allowing me the time to clarify uh, that statement. Uh, there definitely was a plan. Uh, the pandemic pay uh, was uh, able to achieve over 8,600 people into long-term care at a critical time. Uh, the long-standing staffing crisis that preceded the pandemic was certainly a stumbling block and certainly put us behind where we would have liked to have been. We were working with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the Public Health Units, Ontario Health, uh, Public Health Ontario, our Public Health Units, our Medical Officers of Health. All of this was a coordinated effort. Uh, uh, and, and really, um, the IPAC, the Infection Prevention Control, we got dollars to our homes and support the IPAC hubs, the, the training for the, uh, the, the uh, staff, the infection prevention and control uh, leads in the homes, making sure that we integrated with the, the expertise that was available. Uh, and, and this was being done uh, rapidly because of the long-standing issues that had been left behind by the previous governments. And the uh, Commission and the Auditor General reports are very clear on that. These were structural deficits. The magnitude of the second wave was so enormous uh, that it was very difficult to overcome. And we worked as— Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Good day, Speaker. Um, my question is for the Premier. Ontarians are sick and tired of empty words and broken promises. They're sick and tired of Liberal governments and Conservative governments promising the moon to get elected, but when it comes time to actually delivering, nothing. Speaker, we can't let another report on long-term care sit on the shelf and gather dust. Too many Ontarians have already paid the price because Liberals and Conservatives spent years doing just that. So my question, Speaker, to the Premier, is will he commit to implementing the recommendations in the long-term care report, and will he commit to doing so immediately? To apply for the government, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and uh, you know I, I thank you for the question. Uh, we take the uh, recommendations from the Commission on Long-Term Care extremely seriously, and we thank the commissioners for their insights and their good work. Uh, as I said, there's 85 recommendations. Some of those are already being acted on, and also with their interim recommendations. Uh, after many, many years of neglect, the commissioner's report is a guide to help us move forward. 
to help us understand objectively what happened in the past, the long-standing issues, what we're doing that is effective, and what we can do in the future. They've made very important recommendations in terms of, of staffing and, and capacity issues and infection prevention and control, and we will continue to address the recommendations. We will have a, a very public reporting on this to make sure that the public is aware of our progress as we move through these recommendations Response. to understand more fully how we can implement them. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, taking um, those recommendations seriously means implementing them immediately, Speaker. And Conservatives can flip-flop all they want, but the reality is that no one no one in the province of Ontario believes a word that they are saying. They promised an iron ring, never delivered on that. They promised to investigate the horrors in long-term care and make sure that neglect never happened. They didn't deliver on that either, Speaker. And they voted against every single motion in this House that we on this side of the House presented. Why? We're all unsure of that either. Speaker, so my question again to the Minister of Long-Term Care and the Premier. Will the Premier and the Minister of Long-Term Care commit to implementing the recommendations in the Long-Term Care Commission's report? No more delays. They need to fix long-term care, hire more PSWs, and make sure that that permanent pandemic pay is made available. Thank you. Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And, and once again, you know, I appreciate the comments from the opposition because it gives me the opportunity to say what we, we have done and we will do. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was no doubt that we were moving uh, to address all the issues that were creating the problems, the staffing, the overcrowding, creating the specialized care centre that would allow us to create capacity in the long-term care homes. And I thank the Grace Hospital for being involved in that. Uh, and, and we have made sure to get dollars, over $2 billion to our homes for infection prevention and control, the staffing needs, the capacity issues, and measures that would help shore up these homes during the attack by COVID. And, and after that, we made sure to have the dollars behind our commitment to four hours of, uh, on average, of daily care per resident. Uh, the 27,000 staff that we're hiring into our, our long-term care homes as they graduate through our college programs across Ontario, through the career colleges and through the district school boards. Response. This will be more than 10,000 people. And I ask, you know, the, the opposition, you know, consider why you voted against our $2 billion into long-term care to fight the pandemic, why you voted against against the measures that we were taking to shore up these homes. You should ask yourself that. Yeah. Next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our government has maintained an unwavering commitment to protecting the health and safety of all Ontarians. And yet, the people of this province continue to be placed at an unnecessarily higher risk of the introduction and spread of COVID variants due to a failure, Mr. Speaker, a failure of the federal government to protect our borders. Can the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction tell this House what steps the government has taken to urge Ottawa to finally, finally get serious about protecting our borders? Okay. The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Mississauga East Cooksville for that question. Since December, our government, led by Premier Ford, has been urging the Prime Minister to take stronger actions at our border. We have sent three official letters uh, to Minister Blair and the federal government asking them to take action to protect Ontarians. Unfortunately, we have received no response. Mr. Speaker, since February, we know that over 5,000 air passenger travels have tested positive for COVID-19. We need to ensure that the people of Ontario are protected from these variants. We now have confirmation of the B1617 variant in Quebec. In Ontario, we have uh, it in Ottawa now, as of yesterday, as uh, the Chief Medical Officer for Ottawa had mentioned. We need to ensure that we do everything we can to get through this third wave. And for that, we need the Prime Ministers to step up and secure our borders. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Clearly, these variants are not swimming into Ontario. We know that these variants of concern coming from other countries are now the dominant 
form of the virus in Canada. When it comes to international travel, border protection is a federal duty, and they have a responsibility, responsibility to protect Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please explain why strict measures at our borders, including a ban on non-essential travel, would help protect Ontarians from variants of concern? Esther. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We know that 90 percent of cases today are variants of concern. We know that Premier Ford was the first Premier in all of Canada to implement uh, testing uh, at our borders after the federal government refused to do so. Mr. Speaker, we have three simple asks. Ban all non-essential travel into the province of Ontario and country. Uh, close the loopholes at the borders and ensure that there's pre-departure uh, pre PCR testing before landing in Ontario for domestic flights as well. Mr. Speaker, we know that people are flying into the United States in Buffalo or Windsor, walking across our borders so they can circumvent mandatory requirements for border crossings. This is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. As we face the third Response. wave here in the province of Ontario, we need stronger measures and we need the federal government to act now. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, after a very difficult year, parents were looking for a bit of hope this week. They hoped to hear about a fully funded plan to safely reopen schools, to get our kids off of screens and back in classrooms. What they got instead was a minister who seems to have given up, given up on safe schools and introduced a plan to make painful online learning permanent. Speaker, why is this government using the cover of the pandemic to try to force this radical change on our public education system now of all times, instead of supporting our kids, our educators, our families where they need it most, back face-to-face -face in smaller, safer classrooms? Fly, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud that under our progressive Conservative government, we are investing more than any government in the history of this province, $1.6 billion specifically in COVID-19 resources. After months of the members opposite and the teacher unions asserting that there'd be a reduction, I'm proud that there is a $2 billion enhancement for next year to ensure we continue to have public health nurses in our schools, asymptomatic testing, access to PPE, more staffing, more cleaning, enhanced screening. These are the investments that the medical community have called for that our Premier is delivering. In fact, Speaker, a targeted plan of $85 million to help support learning recovery. And yes, we believe on this side of the House, the choice for parents at a time of still um, you know, an unknown of where this pandemic will take us in the coming months. Giving parents the choice exactly. of remote learning is a strength, knowing full well that we've invested $40 million more in our most recent budget to hire more staff, to expand our infrastructure, to build upon the nearly 200,000 more tablets, internet connections, supporting families. We're going to be there for students to make sure schools reopen in September safely while maintaining excellence within our classrooms. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you what's historic. What's historic is this minister's exaggeration. And the Ontarians, Ontarians across this province are just tired of it. A closer look at school board funding shows an actual increase of just 0.28% over last year's grants. And I want to point out that is way below inflation. The Pupil Foundation grant is down despite a projected increase in enrollment, and boards are going to be forced to dip into their depleted reserves once again. This flatlining of funding means real cuts to classrooms, and parents know that this absurd plan for permanent online learning is about moving more dollars out of schools into private companies and undermining public education. That's no choice at all. Sure. Speaker, our kids need care, not cuts. Safe schools, not more screen time. How can this premier and this minister possibly justify this? Mr. Speaker, let's uh, hear from some of the stakeholders that have commented on the matter. The head of the Ontario school, uh, Public School Board Association said, quote, 
um, that they are pleased that the government will continue to provide funding for many pandemic-related items, Order. including PP, public health nurses, and the renewal of technology and devices. Uh, in the words of Lawrence Barnes, the president and CEO of the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario, uh, by resourcing educators to better meet the needs of all students, Ontario is advancing more accessible, caring, inclusive learning in our education system. In the words of Catherine Hay, the president and CEO of Kids Help Phone, quote, we're grateful to the government and to the Ministry of Education for continuing to provide critical funds to support the mental health of our youth in this province. Mr. Speaker, our commitment is to ensure schools reopen in September safely with a $1.6 billion plan that has been designed following the best medical expert advice, giving choice to parents in class and online, and maintaining the high standards within our schools. That's our commitment. Response. That's what we're going to continue to focus on for September. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. There are two ongoing investigations connected to the Premier's friends, Bond's working families, and his pick for OLG chair. There is, however, one investigation that hasn't happened yet. So last May, after the Canadian Armed Forces filed their final report into the conditions in long-term care, the Premier told all of us a full investigation had been launched and the results would be turned over to police. Never happened. Solicitor General confirmed that yesterday. Despite 26 residents dying from dehydration, malnourishment, and Speaker, other horrific findings in the report, no investigation was launched. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier explain to families who lost a loved one why the investigation you said he launched never happened? And to reply on behalf of the government, Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, I certainly uh, refute the um, accusations of the member opposite. The patient ombudsman, the auditor general, and the commissioners have all scrutinized the events of COVID-19 pandemic in long-term care. The Ontario Ombudsman is still investigating. All deaths in long-term care homes are required to be reported to the coroner, and where appropriate, the coroner investigates. The Premier promised an investigation in the wake of the Canadian Armed Forces report, and that investigation took place. Each home was also inspected by two or more inspectors, some of those lasting over a month. Those reports were posted publicly. Had inspectors found potentially criminal conduct, they would have passed that information on to the police. Thank you. Okay. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, perhaps the minister should speak to the Solicitor General because it hasn't happened. And if she actually read the Commission's report and saw some of the things that were in there and also understood the Commission's lawyers' remarks afterwards, you know that failing to provide necessities of life or death from negligence could trigger criminal charges against home operators or the corporate directors of the people who own it. In November of last year, the government passed legislation that would shield itself and long-term care home operators from COVID-19 related lawsuits. The government also failed to enact provisions in Bill 160 that would have made it easier to take over a home or to suspend a license. It also would have increased fines for home operators and directors and corporations that were found to be in non-compliance. So, Speaker, can the Premier explain why it's more important to protect his friends in large long-term care home for-profit operations than it is to find justice for families who've lost a loved one? Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I want to be clear that this has been devastating uh, for families, residents, staff, and, and for many long-term care homes. And you know, getting the, the Canadian Armed Forces into the homes, using the hospitals, the local um, public health units, Ontario Health, and working across uh, government and the sector to shore up these homes, no one will deny the tragedy that occurred. But it does not automatically mean that someone broke the law. And the appropriate people to determine whether a crime has taken place are the police and the courts, not politicians. And I don't think it's appropriate for the opposition to politicize our courts, our police services, or this tragedy. Order. Order. The member 
For Guelph said the other day, taking responsibility is taking action, and that's exactly what we've done Order. throughout this pandemic, and that's what we're doing as we move forward with our plans to modernize long-term care and bring it into the 21st century. We have a plan, and we will commit to that plan. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Stricter border measures stop and slow, uh, slow the spread of COVID-19. This is a fact backed by the science and data. And our respected allies around the world have implemented them with great success. While our government continues to ask for real action to secure our borders, this is not a priority for the Prime Minister. It is even more disappointing to see Stephen Del Duca and the provincial liberals resort to ugly attacks in order to score cheap political points. Speaker, I was offended by the Liberal leader's racial remarks. Order. Can the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction tell this House if the government's policy on securing our borders are somehow xenophobic or an attack on Ontarians as Mr. Del Duca suggests? Thank you. Order. The reply? the Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I agree with the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. It's, uh, I don't understand why certain members of the opposition are making light uh, of serious concerns about our safety uh, and engaging in this divisive and hurtful rhetoric. Over a two-week period, we know that at Pearson International Airport, 35 international flights and 23 domestic flights have landed at Pearson. We know that over 150,000 people in that same two-week period have crossed our land borders. In April, the region of Peel uh, and the city of Brampton passed unanimous motions asking for the federal government to secure or restrict, uh, restrict flights into Pearson International, given that Peel is a hot spot and is suffering from many of these variants. Is a leader of the Liberal Party suggesting that the region of Peel or the city of Brampton councillors are racist. This is absurd, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to call on the federal government to have stronger actions at our borders to protect the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I know many of my constituents and people around Ontario continue to follow the rules and make sacrifices in order to help defeat COVID within their community. Can the minister share what he is hearing from his constituents in Brampton, one of the most diverse and fastest growing parts of Ontario? Thank you. Associate Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We know that uh, these new variants are not originating in Ontario or in Canada. They're not swimming across the ocean, Mr. Speaker. And people continue to use loopholes to circumvent the rules that have been put in place to protect Ontarians and secure uh, the safety of all, especially in Brampton and Peel Region. My constituents are frustrated. They are doing their part. They are following the public health advice that has been put forward. But the federal government, after three official requests, has refused to take actions that the, that the Premier of this province has put forward and put to the federal government. Mr. Speaker, we need to ensure that our borders are secure. We have three simple asks. Ban all non-essential travel into the province of Ontario and Canada. Close the loopholes at our Spons. land borders and implement PCR testing to fly even domestically into the province of Ontario. We must secure our borders. Thank you. The next question. The member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Premier emerged from a 14-day quarantine after a close contact in his office tested positive for COVID-19. Unlike the thousands of essential workers in Ontario who can't work from home and who don't have paid sick days, the Premier collected his full salary while he was in self-isolation. Thank goodness he didn't develop COVID, but if he had, he would still have collected his full salary. 
He wouldn't have had to rely on three paid sick days capped at $200 a day, then apply to the federal program and wait to see if he qualified for a weekly benefit of $500. Speaker, why does the Premier think that he deserves 14 days of full pay while following public health advice, but the essential workers he likes to call heroes don't? Members, so please take your seat. To reply, the parliamentary assistant, member for Burlington. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me remind the member opposite that we announced that we want to double the federal program to 1,000 per Order. week for four weeks, plus three paid sick days. This is the most comprehensive plan in Canada. If a worker needs to take time off to vaccinate, to get vaccinated, they can be paid. If a worker needs to take time off to recover for a vaccination, they can be paid. If a mom or dad has a sick child at home or symptoms related to COVID-19, they can stay home and be paid. If a worker in Ontario is suffering from mental health challenges related to COVID-19, they can stay home and get paid. Mr. Speaker, this is the most generous, open and flexible plan and balance because we're reimbursing all small, biz small businesses and employers. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, not only did the Premier ignore the experts calling for 14 paid sick days, but he has also made things worse for the lowest paid Ontario workers. If low-wage workers are sick and need a full week off to recover, this government's program only pays them for three days, which is $300 at minimum wage. Under the federal program, they would have received $500 for the week. But to access the federal program, workers must notify their employer in writing that they will be taking unpaid sick days, apply for CRSB, and hope they qualify. More barriers to prevent workers from staying home if they are sick. Speaker, why won't this government give all workers the ability to stay home if they are sick without losing their pay? Members, please take your seat. Again, to respond, the member for Burlington. Just to be clear, without any help from you helping us at all, we work diligently with the minister and our government to go from 12 Order. to 14 days down to three to five days and from 10 to 20, 10 to 20 days. So right now, we have three paid sick days. So you keep talking about 14. The math is we have three paid sick days coupled with 20. On top of that is 23 days. It's the most comprehensive plan in Canada. Thank you very much. And the next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Freedom of religion, religious liberty, is a fundamental principle that supports the freedom of an individual or community in public or private to manifest its beliefs in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. This is a principle that the current government professes to support when looking for votes at campaign time. But last Sunday, Trinity Bible Chapel in Woolwich Township had its religious liberty attacked, its doors locked, no service, no prayer, no congregation, as a result of the Attorney General going to court to get an injunction to take over the property and the building and shut the church down. What is the government's justification for being the first government in Ontario history to attack religious liberty by taking control and shutting down a church from congregating and meeting in prayer? And to reply, the member for Durham and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, everyone in this House respects freedom of religion. There's, that's, that's never a, a question. Um, in this particular case, I understand church services were held at Trinity Bible Chapel on Sunday, April 4th, April 11th, and April 25th, 2021, despite an injunction order. Um, as this matters before the courts, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to comment further at this time. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in addition to the injunction, the church potentially faces millions in fines and possible jail time for the church as well as its pastors and elders. It is my understanding that the government this week is attempting to ask the court to also grant its injunction request that would give the Attorney General control of the church building and property as long as this government keeps emergency orders in place. My question, does this government plan on taking control of any and all church buildings of any church that congregates with more than 10 individuals while emergency orders are in place. Member for Durham. 
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the court granted interim relief in the form of an order uh, directing the sheriff to lock the doors of the church on a time-limited basis. Uh, the doors were ordered to be locked before midnight May 1, 2021, for one week. Uh, on May 1, the sheriff locked the doors of the church. Uh, on May 6, the parties will attend uh, a court, actually this morning, uh, for a hearing to determine whether the order of April 30th, 2021 should continue to uh, or be varied. Uh, of course, because there's an, this is an ongoing court matter, it's really inappropriate for me to comment further. Right. The next question, the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, students and their families are dealing with great social and financial uncertainty and due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that our government has always put students at the center of our education policies, and that, that, and that was why I was so pleased to hear that our government is continuing with our pre-pandemic plan to help increase access to post-secondary education by ensuring its affordability for all Ontario residents. Speaker, would the Minister of Colleges and Universities please tell the House what the government is doing to help students with more financial certainty during these difficult times? To reply, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South and parliamentary system. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for that great question. Uh, Speaker, we understand that students and their families make great sacrifice to pursue higher education in our post-secondary institutes across this province. That's why we're extending the tuition freeze for all post-secondary students in Ontario. This builds, Speaker, on the historic 10 percent tuition cut that this government introduced when we first took office. Under the uncertainty of COVID-19 pandemic, as we navigate this together, when it comes to the tuition for students across this province, we understand that this uncertain times, you need a government that's here for you and that's working with you. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, my message to the students of Ontario is as you embark on the 2021-2022 student year, your tuition will not change. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. I know that our government has always put students first, and that has not changed with this pandemic. I'm glad that our government is ensuring the affordability of post-secondary education in our province for another year. I know that this is welcome news for students and their families in my writing, uh, in my writing because clear commitments like these will help increase the predictability and ease the financial strain on family pocketbooks. Speaker, would the minister please elaborate on why this important announcement is so needed for students in Ontario? Assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for that question. Under, after a decade in which Ontarian students and their families saw the largest tuition increase in Canadian history under the previous Liberal government, our government took historic steps to lower tuition by 10 percent across the board for all students in this province. This, Mr. Speaker, was the first of its kind in Ontario, saving students and families an estimated $450 million. Mr. Speaker, after 15 years of unchecked tuition growth that made summers all the more hard for the hardworking students of this province, our government stepped up. In 2019-20, StatsCan shows Ontario was the only province in this federation to introduce a tuition decrease, while tuition concurrently Response. grew in eight other provinces and one other territory. Before I was elected, tuition was the highest in Ontario across this country. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's no longer the case. Students in this province can understand that this government is standing Thank by. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Small businesses in Toronto Centre are fed up. They've been closed for more than six months. Many have had to permanently close because they can't hold out any longer. Our once vibrant main streets have been replaced with empty, boarded up storefronts. The supports that this government promised have not materialized. Some business owners in my riding who applied for the small business grant have yet to see the money actually arrive, and many have been denied without any explanation. 
Even those that are accepted are telling me that the grants don't cover the tens of thousands of dollars it costs to pay their rent, hydro and insurance. Why isn't this government fixing the flawed grant program that is leaving so many of our small businesses behind? To apply, the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And we recognize that this is a significantly difficult time for many small businesses across the province, and that is why we put forward the largest uh, program in all of Canada to help support small businesses get through this very difficult time. To date, over 108,000 businesses, uh, totaling over $1.5 billion of direct payments, have been made uh, from the first uh, Ontario Business Support Grant as we continue to work through many applications. Um, there has also been over 73,000 second automatic payments that have been made uh, to small business owners automatically into their accounts because we recognize that this is a significantly different, uh, difficult time for them. That's another $1.1 billion that have flowed into the accounts of small business owners. That's a total of $2.6 billion uh, for small businesses. Um, that does also uh, recognize that we have programs in place to cover 100% of their energy costs, 100% of their property tax costs, and then they can also access uh, digital Main Street grants of up to $2,500 to help them uh, pivot digitally because we know that uh, during Response. this time, uh, strong e-commerce platforms are needed to support businesses. And we'll continue to do whatever we can to get that money flowing into businesses as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Andrew is a small business owner in my riding and told me he was hopeful when the government announced the business support grant program. He runs a store, and during COVID, it has been incredibly difficult, and, and he desperately, desperately needs the help. But for weeks, he heard nothing back from your program and then was denied with no explanation. Despite making several calls and sending emails to ask why his application for the only lifeline this government is willing to offer him was rejected, he has yet to receive a reply. The stress of having absolutely no safety net after two lockdowns is getting too hard to carry. Why is this government refusing to help small business owners like Andrew, and how, how do you expect these businesses to have a fighting chance of making it through this third wave? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, tripled the support staff uh, behind uh, this program to ensure that business owners get responses as quickly as possible. Um, we will, you know, I would uh, love to uh, ask the, the member to provide some more information to me uh, afterwards so we can look into this case. All eligible businesses uh, that can apply to this program will uh, we'll receive the funding, uh, Mr. Speaker. As we have noted, over 108,000 first payments, uh, totaling over $1.5 billion, have been paid out. Over uh, 73,000 in second payments, totaling another $1.1 billion, have been paid out. It's $2.6 billion in direct supports to small businesses to date, Mr. Speaker. We will do anything and everything we can to support these small businesses, including the 100 per cent property tax relief, the 100 per cent energy cost relief that is still uh, out there for these businesses to access. So uh, I will ask the member uh, afterwards uh, to, to alert me to some of the uh, application, and I will uh, take it back uh, and, and ensure that we get a response uh, for Andrew and his, uh, and his business. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Last Thursday, the College of Physicians and Surgeons issued a notice and warning to the medical profession regarding the alleged spread of misinformation. Quote, physicians hold a unique position of trust with the public and have a professional responsibility not to communicate anti-vaccine, anti-masking, anti-distancing, and anti-lockdown statements. And further, quote, physicians who put the public at risk may face an investigation by the CPSO and disciplinary action when warranted. Speaker, this is a frightening and unacceptable. It carries the risk of vitiating informed consent. It dangerously infringes on the doctor-patient relationship. Speaker, the CPSO is governed by the Regulated Health Professions Act, a provincial legislation. Will the minister support Ontario's doctors speaking their conscience and publicly disavow the statement by the CPSO? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, as you know, the CPSO is the regulator for physicians, and they are simply indicating that they want physicians to be informed and to answer any questions that people have and to provide people with accurate advice. I don't see anything wrong with that. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, there is no room for ambiguity here. The statement of the CPSO speaks for itself, and it shocked many doctors in the medical profession. COVID or no COVID, we're still a Western democracy. This government, this minister, have a responsibility to defend speech. We're talking about doctors duly licensed in the province of Ontario, not rogue dissidents who are threatening the regime. A doctor should be able to say that a lockdown is harmful. A doctor should be able to say that masks outside make no sense, even if public health recommends them in some outdoor situations. Censoring medical speech because it's dangerous to people's safety is something you'd expect from a totalitarian regime. Is there a line that we will not cross? So I asked the minister again, will she stand up for Ontario's doctors and disavow the threat they made against Ontario's doctors last Thursday? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, if I would say to the member, through you, Mr. Speaker, I don't understand what your significant concern here is. This is something that the College of Physicians and Surgeons is simply advising the doctors to uh, rely on their own medical information and knowledge and experience and speak to anybody asking questions of them and providing them with accurate medical advice. That's what the college should advise the physicians to do, and that is what they are doing now. So I don't believe that there's any concern with this whatsoever. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I have surveyed local businesses to find out how the Ontario Small Business Support Grant Program is helping the business community of University Rosedale. Now, many businesses aren't even eligible for the program, but for those who are eligible and who have applied for aid, 85 per cent of the businesses have not received their money. 85 per cent of eligible businesses who have applied to the government's small business program have not received their money. Premier, I have a list of over um, uh, 150 eligible businesses that have applied for the program and have been approved who have not received their money. Can the Premier commit to helping them? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, we will definitely, if you, the member opposite could uh, pass over that list, uh, uh, every eligible business that has applied to this program uh, will definitely get the, the supports that they need. As I've noted, over 108,000 businesses to date have received their first payment. That's $1.5 billion in direct payments and support uh, to small businesses. On top of that, we have done an automatic doubling of those uh, first payments, and of those uh, uh, 73,000 businesses have received uh, the support. That's another $1.1 billion. That is $2.6 billion that has been paid out by this government to support small businesses that we recognize have had significant challenges during this time. And we also encourage those business owners to apply uh, for the property tax a rebate of 100%, uh, the energy cost rebate of 100%, to apply to other programs that they can get 90% of their rent covered, they can get their wage subsidy covered up to 75%. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, we will definitely work with the member opposite to, to look into the, the concerns that she has raised on those specific applications. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I have the list of all the businesses with their contacts, names, email, and phone number over, and they've requested that I give this letter to you with their information to follow up. So I will be handing this to you after question period. Uh, back to the Premier. Uh, there is no question that this government is failing to help the small business community in my riding. It's taken 11 months and two province wide shutdowns for this government to finally offer support. And we're now in this third state of emergency, and quite frankly, there's not enough money flowing into University Rosedale to help these businesses get by. There's no money for Maria Gallipo of Sicilian Sidewalk Cafe, who said that her application process was incredibly stressful. Her staff, the staff in the program were uninformed and unable to help. There was no money for people like Emile, a medical equipment manufacturer, who told me that they are at complete breaking point and worried about paying the rent. And there is no money for Jason of Question. One Plant Kensington Market, who just wants to know when the money is going to arrive. He's applied, he's been approved, he just wants to know when it's going to apply. Premier, when will you fix this small business grant program so businesses can get the support they need? Again, the Associate Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Since the start of this pandemic, we have uh, put forward significant resources to help support small businesses that we know have been struggling during this time. That started with uh, 
the first month uh, in ensuring that they got uh, rent relief uh, in March, April, May, and that program has uh, continued to date. Uh, we have ensured that we put forward the Main Street Relief Grant. That was a $60 million uh, program to support PPE costs that businesses uh, were facing. We have uh, ensured uh, that uh, you know, those in red zones and those in lockdown zones have always had their uh, property tax covered to 100 percent, that they have had their energy costs covered to 100 percent. The Small Business Support Grant, the largest support grant program for businesses um, in anywhere in, in Canada, has put forward already $2.6 billion of direct supports into the accounts of small business owners. Now, we recognize uh, that there are some business owners that Response. haven't received it, and we will work with uh, the member opposite and uh, others and, and ensure that those small businesses that need the support get the support and direct payments into their account. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for scarborough Gladewood. My question is to the Premier. This past year, the pandemic has been difficult for Ontario families to navigate. The uncertainty of businesses opening and closing has been an unpredictable experience shared by schools and childcare facilities. Not everyone can work from home. It is even more challenging for parents if their children are at home as well. It is mostly women who bear the burden of caring for and educating their children at home, and it is their careers that suffer. This has been established as a major characteristic of the she session, and yet we hear nothing from the government about a she recovery. Speaker, the federal government has budgeted for a $10 a day daycare plan, and today Stephen Del Duca and the Ontario Liberals have promised to do the same. Will the Premier work with the Liberals, the federal government, and the women of Ontario to provide the economic infrastructure Question. of affordable daycare and quality Order. early learning so everyone in Ontario can build back better. To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, the um, Del Duca Liberals announced within their first 100 days action, but for 15 years, for 5,000 days, the legacy they left is income stagnation, the highest uh, child care costs in the nation, as well as um, you know, rising costs of living. It was one of the most expensive child care systems in the world under your watch. And it really is regrettable, with 800 child care centres closing over a four-year period under your watch. And I think the sharp contrast is under our Premier, where we have a $2 billion investment on an annualized basis, creating 30,000 new spaces within our schools. Last year alone, 16,000 more spaces were created. And in our most recent budget, a top-up to the child care tax credit, providing up to $1,500 per child in the pockets of parents with maximum flexibility, recognizing that a one-size-fits-all system does not work for moms and dads in all parts of this province. Yes, we're going to work with the federal government Response. in collaboration to make life affordable, but we'll take no lessons from the Del Duca win Liberals after. Thank you. The supplementary question. And Speaker, you know, I urge this government to take lessons from the experience of parents. I just talked to a mom of three who has two toddlers under her arm and one school-aged child outside working online on his own. It is so unfortunate that this government cannot look past their own partisan agenda and govern, invest, and support women in Ontario. My riding of Scarborough Guildwood faces an affordable childcare crisis and a before and after school deficit. There simply just aren't enough programs available in the riding. Without an expansion of childcare and early learning and before and after school care, women cannot break the cycle of having to take lower paying part time jobs. The Ontario Liberal Party has committed to cutting the cost of the before and Question. after school care by 50 percent, which could help inject $7 billion every year into our economy and increase women's participation in the labour market. Speaker, does the Premier want to invest in these programs, or will he continue to transfer those costs to women? Mr. Education. Under our government, we're going to continue to make life affordable for working moms and dads in this province, but we will not follow the approach and the policy program of the former Liberal government under, uh, under Stephen Del Duca, where, under their leadership, childcare became 
almost the most expensive program in the nation. That is not a metric by which you should be or any one of us should be proud of. And so what do we do in our first budget? We introduce a child care tax credit. We're up to 75 percent of eligible expenses are supporting 300,000 parents. We topped it up in the most recent budget under the Minister of Finance's leadership, a 20 percent top-up, now covering 90 percent of eligible costs. Last year, 16,000 more spaces were created. And in contrast to their government, where we had 800 child care centres closed over the last four years of their government, and the most expensive child care system, it's obviously something most distressing. What parents deserve is choice, affordability and access, and our Response. premium delivery. Next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The Auditor General's damning report on the government's COVID response illustrated a serious concern that long-term care and retirement homes are being used to warehouse alternative level care patients. Uh, patients like my constituent, John, who was in hospital recovering from his second leg amputation. When the minister gave the edict to clear patients out to create room for COVID patients, John was sent to a new ALC wing in a long-term care home, and his family was assured that he would have access to the same level of care that he received in the hospital. But he's been stuck in the ALC wing since August 2020. He's being billed $1,034 a day. I have a bill here for nearly a quarter of a million dollars, $241,956 to be exact. So this minister keeps saying uh, that she takes full responsibility. But my question to the minister, through question. you, Mr. Speaker, is can the minister explain how she has allowed this to happen to John and the tens of thousands of people who are waiting for long-term care bed in the province of Ontario? I thank the Honourable uh, Member for her question. Uh, I'm, of course, not uh, familiar with the uh, specifics of, uh, of the case that she uh, raises, but uh, if she would like to uh, send it over after question period, uh, we'll certainly uh, take a look. Point of order, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome and to congratulate my brother, Andrew Hunter, and his wife, Ildiko Horvath, on the birth of Jordan Isaac Oscar Hunter, who is five months old today. Thank you very much. Question period is concluded. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that on the ballot list draw of November 4th, 2019, Mr. Smith, Peterborough Kawartha, assumes ballot item number 83, and the ballot list draw of May 5th, 2021, Ms. Fee assumes ballot item number 85. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Long-Term Care concerning the investigation into Canadian Armed Forces report. This matter will be debated Tuesday, May the 11th, 2021, following private members' public business. There being no further business at this time, the House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>